All right, everybody, we're going to have an incredible, incredible uh, gathering uh, this evening. Uh, I'm, of course, as you know, this is pre-recorded. I am not even in town at the moment, uh, but I thought it good to be able to debut uh, material on Mariology that will hopefully be edifying for you. Uh, that being said, we're going to look at the bodily assumption of Mary in, in uh, St. Epiphanius. But before we begin, as usual, I like to begin with prayer. I am greatly edified to be able to uh, record this and be hopefully God will be with you in the chat, uh, watching along as we, uh, we talk about the vitally important topic of the bodily assumption of Mary. Uh, Generally, we'll probably look at a few church fathers, and um, we will be looking at it. We'll look at a few things James White has also said. Now, I don't talk about James White often. Why don't I talk about him often? Uh, I don't take him very seriously. He's not somebody you're, you should take seriously when it comes to Mariology. Um, if you look at any of the material he's put out, it's very bad. He's utilizing arguments from the 1990s that have been ripped to shreds already. <clears throat> There's a particular reason why James White won't debate me, and not only me, but anybody over at Reason of Theology. He knows he would get roasted out of his mind. He would get made a fool of. He doesn't know Mariology, doesn't know the Immaculate Conception. Believe it or not, as much as he wishes he did, he doesn't even know uh, the, the, father, the way the fathers refer to Mary as Theotokos, as Theotokos. He does know the whole history of that. Uh, definitely is terrible when it comes to Mary as uh, ever virgin and the bodily assumption of Mary. But I recognize there are people that put forth decent arguments. He's one of them. Indeed, Dr. Gavin Ortland, when I had a discussion with him uh, a couple of weeks back or maybe a month ago, I don't remember quite when, uh, you found uh, Dr. Gavin Ortland um, using the very same arguments quite use, even if he may not be aware of it. Even if people aren't aware and they recycle the same stuff White uses, you know, it's really kind of the best stuff they have on the internet. That being said, St. Epiphanius, uh, or Epiphanius, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and the bodily assumption of Mary. You rarely hear about Epiph uh, uh, Epiphanius talking. Uh, you barely look and utilize the Epiphanius when talking about the bodily assumption, because people are aware of an area where he is rather agnostic as to the end of Mary's life. But all scholars recognize, and when I say scholars, I mean those have actually done work within the realm of Mariology, recognize that St. Epiphanius also in the Panarian does talk about Mary being bodily translated into heaven. We will briefly look at Epiphanius. In fact, we'll read them, and then we're gonna look at what, uh, what Dr. White has to say about uh, Epiphanius and the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. We're going to examine Panarian 79. We're going to look at the, the Greek as well. Yes, of course, Mary's body was holy. Remember that he's writing, he is uh, condemning the idolatry of the Coloridians, condemning the idol. And indeed, we all, every individual that is part of the ancient faith, Syriac Orthodoxy, uh, Chaldean Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Byzantine or Roman Catholicism, any branch of Eastern Christianity uh, are very clear. They condemn any worship given to Mary. Mary is not to be given sacrifice. Only God alone receives latru, latria, worship due to God alone. We give Mary, we venerate Mary. We give Mary hyperdulia because the Bible presents Mary as the greatest creation of our Lord and Saviors. The greatest, the early fathers are very clear about that as well. So uh, Epiphanius is railing against those that were giving worship to Mary. Yes, of course, Mary's body was holy, but she was not God. Yes, the Virgin was indeed a Virgin and honored as such, but she was not given to us to worship. She worships him who, though born of her flesh, has come from heaven, from the bosom of his father, and the gospel therefore protects us by telling us on, uh, us so on the occasion when the Lord himself said, Woman, what is between me and thee? Mine hour is not yet come. 
to make sure that no one would suppose because of the words, what is between me and you, that the Holy Virgin is anything more than a woman. He called her woman as if by prophecy. Of course, we recognize a woman is, uh, is a prophetical title <coughs> given to Mary <coughs> because of the schisms and sects that were to appear on earth. Otherwise, some might stumble into the nonsense of the sect from excessive awe of the saint. What is that excessive awe? That is the latria, the worship being given to Mary, Mariolatry from the Coloradians. We condemn that. For what this sect has to say is complete nonsense, and as it were, an old wives' tale. Which scripture has spoken of it? Which prophet permitted the worship of a man, let alone a woman? The vessel is choice, but a woman, and by nature, no different from others. And then here we go. <clears throat> here is where we get the incredible language that leads us to recognize what St. Epiphanius is saying about the bodily assumption of Mary. Like the bodies of the saints, however, she has been held in honor for her character and understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up and has not seen death. She is like John, who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved. She is like St. Tecla, and Mary is still more honored than she, because of the providence vouchsafed her. But Elijah is not to be worshipped, even though he is alive. And John is not to be worshipped, even though by his own prayer, or rather by receiving the grace from God, he made an awesome thing of his dormition, falling asleep. But neither is Tekla worshipped, nor any of the saints. Did you catch the incredible parallelism here? Parallelism. Did you catch it? She's like Elijah. How is she like Elijah? She's virgin, virgin from the mother's womb, always remains so. So Mary is i.e. Parthenos. Mary is ever virgin. We've got one dogma right there of Mary. Mary is i.e. Parthenos, ever virgin. She was taken up the way Elijah was and has not seen death. Mary was bodily assumed into heaven the way Elijah was bodily translated into heaven. But there's more to be said. And rather than spoiling the fun that we've got for the party, that is barely beginning. Let us examine. You gotta love the um, the arrogance of James White, and we're gonna hear a little bit. We'll pause every now and then uh, to examine what uh, James White is saying. But let's begin. He's rather thrilled, rather happy uh, that he's going to try and trash uh, the bodily assumption of Mary. What you're gonna find is James White getting a big, big mud pie right in his face. Now you may be wondering, James White, when are you gonna deal with William? When are you gonna answer him? I've communicated with James not too long back. I'll tell you right now, James White won't debate me and James White won't come on reason of theology. There's one reason why James White thinks I'm a meanie. I'm a real mean guy, I'm a meanie, you know? You know, James thinks I'm a really mean guy. James knows better. He knows that if he debates anybody, that knows anything about Mariology, he will get roasted. And I'm telling, I'm not telling anybody, oh, look, William, I'm William, I'm the greatest, no. But anybody that has done work in the field of Mariology, anyone that knows and has heard his talks, recognize they're bankrupt, they're terrible. I recommend you hear his debates in the Immaculate Conception. He doesn't know what the heck the doctrine is. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Sure, he'll read the dogma and laugh and become giddy. Then he'll read Fulgentius and Rusby and read Basil and other fathers say, oh, well, look, the Immaculate Conception has been refuted. James White has no idea where to begin when it comes to Mariology. He doesn't know the intricacies of the dogma. I'm telling you, that is why he will stick to Twitter or he'll probably look for another individual. Look up that guy uh, he debated. He debated, I think, um, a Mormon or a non-believer, I don't remember, a guy that had never debated in his life before. Can you believe that? I told James, James, let's debate the Marian dogmas. Oh, I'm looking for people that are really serious about debating, is what he told me. I've got it recorded. He told me that. And then he went and he debated a guy who's never had a debate before, ever. The guy's ah, stra starstruck there, was debating James White. He said, I've never debated before. My family are thrilled that I've gotten the opportunity to debate James White. 
What does that tell you? James White, the famous theologian of the Muslims, the famous apologist to Islam, the apologist that is known of, uh, for being very, very kind, being really kind, really kind of tiptoeing, doesn't want to cause too much controversy. Like, be careful about spreading the gospel. You don't want to offend the Muslims. Be very careful there. So James White is very, very well known for, uh, for trying to not offend uh, Muslims. He will let Muslims get away with murder during the debate. They can blaspheme all that they want. Uh, James will stand right there and he'll repeat the arguments he's been using since 2001. It doesn't matter if they've tried to refute them. Uh, it doesn't matter if they offer pushback. Uh, he'll repeat them. He's got nothing new. He has nothing new under the sun. He doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to Islam. So how can you expect him to know what he's talking about when it comes to Mariology? If he's been called out by apologists that are proficient, that are experts on Islam, if they're telling you, James is terrible at what he's doing against Islam. And I'm telling you as somebody that has, that has debated Mariology for nearly two decades, that has written extensively on the Marian dogmas, that is very good friends with top Marian scholars in the world. I'm telling you, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We're gonna hear, we're gonna catch a glimpse into just how delusional James White is. Fentissimus Deus, it's a really hard word to say. Um, it says this doctrine is revealed by God. So both in, in the defining of the bodily assumption in 1950 and the Immaculate Conception uh, 100 years earlier, almost 100 years earlier, uh, it said these are doctrines revealed by God. This is this is revelation. That's interesting. Um, almost every Catholic apologist, and Peter D. Williams did this, Jerry Maddox did this, they want to... I've got to be quite honest with you. I mean no disrespect to Peter Williams and none to Jerry Maddox, but neither of them have done any work when it comes to Mariology. I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. Neither of them have done any work when it comes to Mariology. James is referring to a debate that he had about, I don't know, five, seven years ago, and then another one that he had over 20 or 25 years ago, where Jerry Maddox showed up and said, I didn't prepare for the debate. That is what James White is referring to. Wrap your head around that, and then you tell me how on earth you can take that guy seriously at all. Establish sort of a hierarchy of truths. And what's weird is we're in this day where we have, well, genetic engineering and nuclear war and gender bending and transgenderism and all this kind of stuff. This is when you would need the clearest uh, insight of Mother Church. And what is Rome doing but, but defining stuff about Mary that is abjectly irrelevant? And Herein we have a, a big problem. If the early church taught it, if the early church recognized clear typological references to the bodily assumption of Mary, if the early church recognized Revelation 12, the woman in the heavens, bodily in the heavens, clothed with the sun, if the church recognized that in a Mariological fashion, then they do have reason to say this is true. If the Dormition, all of the famous Dormition homilies, talk about this, if the church had a very early period, by the way, we'll be talking about newly discovered manuscripts in another video, but if the church was very clear on this at a very early period of time, if we even have it in the great Ephraim, who was, uh, as some scholars say, disconnected from the world, the problem would not be with the teaching of the bodily assumption of Mary. The problem would be with the arrogance of a James White to say, well, why is the church defining something? Indeed, if James White had done any homework, he would have recognized even Martin Luther, Martin Luther, recognized the church taught and believed in the bodily assumption of Mary, the Dormition and the bodily assumption of Mary. This didn't come out of thin air in the 1900s. But there's on and on you go, I'm not going to play 22 minutes of James White. Quite frankly, he's not good enough.
He doesn't know the issues well enough. We're going to go to the 13 minute mark. We're going to get to the meat and potatoes. And I'm going to show you why you shouldn't trust this man. I'm going to show you why the garbage that he's peddling and trying to sell you as gold is real, really fool's gold. It's trash. You open up that uh, treasure chest and it's a bunch of junk and trash in there. And whether he's doing it on purpose or not, or whether he's taking the argument from his, his friend who, by the way, Catholic legate, my heart will always, a piece of my heart will always belong with a legate. The Catholic legate sent his buddy, Eric Svensson, riding on that horse off into the sunset when his terrible argument of Heos who was crushed and destroyed. One of the most ridiculous, non-scholarly, silly arguments ever utilized an embarrassment to any kind of scholarly research. And James should be ashamed that he ever utilized those arguments. His friend was sent back into the sunset because he was a failure when it came to Mariology. We're going to expose James White as a failure when it comes to this very teaching as well, trying to mislead people, very clearly trying to lead them down an erroneous path. It's extremely important. Um, uh, for example, Everett Ferguson in the Encyclopedia of Early Christianity, Epiphanius' approach suggests strongly the absence of a fixed tradition on Mary's final lot. Isidore of Seville, uh, 636, breaks the general silence, but only to attest profound ignorance on the way Mary left this earth. Now, 636, that's over half a millennium later. A century later, the English Bede confessed his ignorance of the final disposition of Mary's body. Um, it is clearly a belief that evolved very, 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 very late in church history. And there were numerous, there are numerous references in the early church where other writers talked about people who were, uh, who were assumed in heaven. Never once is Mary mentioned. Now, why would you mention We have a big problem, and the big problem is when we hear an argument that <laughs> the early church never mentioned it. Putting aside Epiphanius, and later on we'll look at Ephraim, Timothy of Jerusalem dated from the 400s. Therefore the virgin is immortal to this day, seeing that he who had dwelt in her transported her to the regions of her assumption. John the theologian, the Lord said to his mother, let your heart rejoice and be glad for every favor and every gift has been given to you from the, my father in heaven and from me and from the Holy Spirit. Every soul that calls upon your name shall not be ashamed, but shall find mercy and comfort and support and confidence, both in the world that now is and in that which is to come in the presence of my father in the heavens. And from that time forth, all knew that the spotless and precious body had been transferred to paradise on the door mission of Mary. Here is our problem. Could you imagine James White or any of his followers ever uttering these words? And by the way, as you can notice in my notes, there, there's many more fathers. There's more, indeed more than that, and even earlier ones than that. The problem we have here is that in the very same vein of uttering incredible Trinitarian language, language that gave honor to our triune God, language that gave honor to our bodily risen Lord and Savior. The very same theologians talked about the spotless and precious body, spotless, no stain of sin in her body, and precious body, which was translated or transferred to paradise. Could any modern day Protestant say that about Mary? Yet the early church, those that came from the lineage of the apostles, those that were part of the apostolic church had no problem affirming that kind of language. Enoch and Elijah and, and not mention Mary, if it was a common belief of everybody. So, numerous references in the early church where other writers talked about people who were uh, who were assumed in heaven. Never once is Mary mentioned. Did you catch that? I hope you did. Because we're told that 
early fathers spoke about Elijah being assumed into heaven, but they never talked about Mary. Yet we have Epiphanius right there. She is like Elijah, virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up, taken up to heaven. You know, the brick problem we have here is that in the early church, there was also a tradition of John, John's dormition. And the parallelism is being made of John's dormition and him being taken up to heaven as well. James White doesn't know about that. That is why he doesn't mention it. You want to know why he doesn't know? He's never read the document. He doesn't know a thing about St. Tecla. He doesn't know a thing about the tradition of the Dormition of John. He barely knows about Elijah. He knows nothing about the bodily assumption of Mary. You need to be careful who you get your theology from. I'm telling you right now, the kind of embarrassment coming out of James White's mouth is the reason you must be careful who you take your theology from. <laughs> But Elijah is not to be worshipped. Mary, being compared to these great saintly figures, is like Elijah, is like John. What is peculiar? What is very peculiar about John? What is what is interesting about John? Well, John is not to be worshipped, even though by his own prayer, or rather by receiving the grace of God, he made an awesome thing of his dormition. But James White doesn't know about that. Now, why would you mention Enoch and Elijah and, and not mention Mary if it was a common belief of everybody? So any kind of, of fair, even-handed analysis of church history would say the bodily assumption was unknown to early Christians. Now, what really, really surprised me was that Peter D. Williams actually took the perspective that in reality, it was so widely believed that no one talked about it. So widely believed, no one denied it, therefore no one said a word about it. Not, not in hundreds and hundreds of sermons, many of which just exalted Mary, no one ever thought to mention what Rome felt needed to be dogmatically defined as a revealed doctrine in 1950, as if there had become this huge hue and cry denying what had always been believed. There wasn't. And he makes reference to Epiphanius. And what is he making reference to? Well, same thing that Tim Staples does. And Tim Staples quotes, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me give you, let me give you the quote that he gives. Um, so here's, here's the quote and Tim is saying, I think we need to really think this through because this is what, here's, here's the quote, like the bodies of the saints, however, she has been held in honor for her character and understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up and has not seen death. And he says, St. Epiphanius clearly indicates his personal agreement with the idea that Mary was assumed into heaven without ever having died. Now here, be very, very noteful. Note how James White has no clue about the tradition of the Dormition of John. Now I'm not telling anybody that that is a tradition where we have tons of evidence, nor am I even promoting it, but I'm telling you, White has no clue what he's even reading. He doesn't know what St. Epiphanius is even saying. He stops right there. Rather than going further and noting the parallelism of Mary's incredible virtue, like that of St. Tecla and the Dormition, which parallels with Mary's Dormition account, he doesn't show that Epiphanius is making, drawing all those parallelisms. Instead, what James White does is he goes to his fridge, opens his fridge, and he grabs a pie, and he smashes the pie in his face. I want you to watch this garbage. Here's where it's really hard to take seriously Roman Catholic abuse of patristic sources. I'm going to read you the whole thing because context really helps. But let me tell you one thing. Context really does help. 
And if anybody thinks, well, you know what, William Albrecht, you know, you're a real meanie calling it garbage and what have you. Look at the arrogance on James White's face. Look at the hate-filled arrogance on his face as he's mocking Catholics and saying that we abuse the church fathers. And I'm a meanie? Look. And I'm the meanie. Hates his personal agreement with the idea that Mary was assumed into heaven without ever having died. Now, here's... Here's where it's really hard to take seriously Roman Catholic abuse of patristic sources. Here's the problem. There's a reason why James White avoids people like me. There's a reason why he wouldn't debate Sam, my dear brother in arms, in a million years. There's a reason why he would never come under reason of theology. Because that kind of rhetoric and abuse, that kind of garbage, would never, ever pass around us. That kind of behavior, that kind of mockery would not pass around us. He would be put to the test, he would be held to the fire, and he would be refuted. I'm going to read you the whole thing, because context really helps. But just, just for a, a clarity for a moment, what if this is how we defended the Trinity against Unitarians? What if James White should actually, would actually stick to the material rather than going on different rabbit trails and trying to, uh, trying to say, well, look, what if we, you know, defended the faith against Unitarians and uh, defended Trinitarianism? Look, no red herrings. Stick to the topic at hand. Can you imagine if we have volumes and volumes of the writings of the early church and the closest we can get to even something that suggests the trinity is something like that how what what, what, what would you think about that the problem here is the argument that all that we have is epiphanius when it comes to the bodily assumption of mary We've got scripture. We have Old Testament typology. We have earlier fathers in Epiphanius. We have fathers contemporaneous to Epiphanius. We have all of the Dormition homilies. At the end of the day, we've got patristic sources and material that predate the ridiculous Calvinist doctrines that James White subscribes to. Are you kidding me? An apologist that holds the sola fide and sola scriptura is trying to argue against um, a, a wealth of early fathers that talked about the Dormition and the bodily assumption of Mary? The problem is, if you read the whole thing, here's context, context, context. I'm, I know, I'm, I'm boring, context. Yes, of course, Mary's body was holy. Because remember, he's talking about the Coloridians here. Yes, of course, Mary's body was holy, but she was not God. You notice, while well, he's talking about the Coloridians, James White, when he says Mary's body is holy, he's saying, we agree that Mary is holy. Mary is holy and Mary is ever virgin, but we don't give her worship. Don't try to tiptoe around the obvious context. Don't try to change your voice to say, well, you know what, he's not giving Mary uh, any kind of veneration there. Get real. Yes, the virgin was indeed a virgin and honored as such, but she was not given us to worship. Boy, uh, that's a problem with uh, hyperdulia. But anyway, she... There you go again. But I want to remind you all about one thing. The very same James White who put out the bogus... And I mean, guess what? It comes from Calvin. Or maybe it came from before him, but I know Calvin utilized it. And I know uh, Turretin, Francis Turretin did as well. Um, the bogus argument of, well, there's no biblical distinction between Latria and Dulia. I want to tell you one thing. There are two different Greek words. Are we to give both to God Almighty? No doubt. But Latria is due to God alone. We can give Dulia to a mere human being. We should give Dulia to God. We do give Proskunet when we do give Latria to God. But the delusion that is in James White's head, well, there's no biblical distinction between Latria and Dulia is one of the most ridiculous arguments I've ever heard. If anyone should be ashamed of how fast and loose they play with their Greek, it should be James White. Now, James White will come back and say, William, where did you study Greek? You know, I studied Greek and I taught Greek. James White, teaching Greek to 14-year-olds in Sunday school 
doesn't count. It doesn't make you a professor of Greek. Because if you knew Greek, you wouldn't be making horrific kind of arguments like the ones that you make. You make a fool of yourself. Nobody takes it seriously, buddy. He worships him who, though born of her flesh, has come from heaven, from the bosom of, the, of his father. And the gospel, therefore, protects us by telling us so on the occasion when the Lord himself said, Woman, what is between me and thee? Mine hour is not yet come. For to make sure that no one would suppose, because the words, what is between me and thee, that the Holy Virgin is anything more than a woman, he called her woman as if by prophecy, because of the schisms, schisms and sects that were to appear on earth. Otherwise, some might stumble into the nonsense of the sect from excessive awe of the saint. For what it has to say is complete nonsense, and an old wives' tale, as it were. Which scripture has spoken of it? Interestingly enough, right in this context, He's asked, asking for scriptural evidence. Which scripture has spoken of it? Which prophet permitted the worship of a man, let alone a woman? The vessel is choice, but a woman, and by nature, no different from others. Hmm, doesn't sound like he believed in the Immaculate Conception either. <laughs> like, Here's a problem. There is no where Epiphanius is saying that Mary is sinful like other women. He's showing that Mary has her nature of a woman. Here's the most ridiculous statement of James White. Let's go to look at it. Let us look at it. Which scripture has spoken of it? Which prophet permitted the worship of a man, let alone a woman? The vessel of choice, but a woman, and by nature no different from others. I want you all to tell me where we argue that Mary doesn't have the nature of a woman. Now, when we speak of Mary having her sinless nature by grace from our Lord Jesus Christ, that is something different from what Epiphanius is talking about. Epiphanius is saying she has the characteristics of a woman. Where on earth do we argue that Mary does not have the nature of a woman? Where on earth? Pray tell, where is Epiphanius saying Mary has a fallen sinful nature like other women? More ad hominem, more attacks on the true biblical and historical Mary. The bodies of the saints, however, she has been held in honor for her character and understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. If Mr. Staples wanted to be accurate. I want you to notice one more time. How James White told you, I'm going to read everything in the context. We're going to read it all. Did James White read everything? Did James White read the parallelism given to John's Dormition? Did he read the parallelism given to Mary to St. Tecla? Of course not. What does context matter when you live in the wild, wacky world of White? Here, he'd continue on. Because what he's saying is, well, he's like Elijah. She's like Elijah. And because she's like Elijah, and Elijah was taken up to heaven, then Mary must have been taken up to heaven. But that's not where he stopped. She is like John, who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved. She is like Saint Thecla, and Mary is still more honored than she because the providence vouchsafed her. But Elijah is not to be worshipped, even though realized in the Son of... Oh, great. Page 625 is not part of this book preview. Thank you. doesn't even own the Panarian. Can you believe that? So he does go forth and read more. He doesn't read, though, as I said, about the Dormition of John. He doesn't. And even if he tries to use the excuse and say, well, you know what? I don't have the, the work. I only had the preview. There is no excuse for him not owning the Panarian or at least looking up the Panarian in Greek and offering his own translation. He can do that. He's taught Greek before. He's a major, major mega Greek scholar. Where, William, what, you know, when James White wrote to me not long ago, well, or, or where he actually did a video of me, oh, well, William, I want to know where you went and you learned your Greek. I'm a Greek scholar. I taught Greek. James, look, James, just because you got tattoos of Greek letters on your arms, just because you've given uh, Greek to Sunday school individuals, you play Greek songs or you read the, the Our Father in Greek, it doesn't mean you're a Greek scholar, buddy. All right, I hate to break it to you. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so 
he makes connections to others immediately thereafter. And the issue for, with Elijah... But what connections does he make? He still doesn't read the connection he's making to the Lodor mission because he hasn't read all of it. He read the connection, I give credit, I didn't think he was going to read it to, to St. Tecla, but he doesn't read the connection to the Lodor mission of John. He doesn't get to that part. That is a major problem. He doesn't care enough to realize why the parallelism is being made. But watch, we're going to see why James White and how he rips it completely out of context. In fact, let's rewind a little bit. Like John, who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved. She is like Saint Thecla, and Mary is still more honored than she because the providence vouchsafed held in honor for her character and understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb. More in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. Virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. Virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. Virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but it virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. You can't script it. You can't script this kind of stuff. James White, refuting James White, you can't do it. I want you to look at the incredulity in his face as he realizes he's been busted. He's probably thinking, have I ever really read the Panarian before? Now that I'm reading it to the audience, I have to play it off. I got to pretend like I still, I'm still in the driver's seat. There's no evidence for the bodily assumption of Mary. If... Mr. Staples wanted to be accurate here, he'd continue on. Because what he's saying is, well, he's like Elijah. She's like Elijah. And because she's like Elijah, and Elijah was taken up to heaven, then Mary must have been taken up to heaven. But that's not where he stopped. You're right. That is not where he stopped. But it doesn't eliminate the parallelism being made, amateur white. She is like John who leaned on the Lord's breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved. She is like Saint Thecla, and Mary is still more honored. If you do not have anything in the context of Epiphanius, anyone contemporaneous with him at all, who believes in the bodily assumption of Mary, how can you read that into his words? This is what Rome has to do. This is what, and all the only time, I, I all I said, in the debate was, I don't believe that, that the citation of Epiphanius bears the weight that you placed upon him. From his mother's womb, all who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but as who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. Next Epiphanius. Anyone contemporaneous with him at all who believes in the bodily assumption of Mary. How can you read that into his words? This is what Rome has to do. This is what, and all, the only time, I, I, all I said in the debate was, I don't believe that, that the citation of Epiphanius bears the weight that you placed upon it. But that's, that's, all the, that's all the time that I had. And I thought afterwards, you know, it would be, it would be good to mention this. Um, in uh, examining this. This is, when you look at this, and you, you think of the rich uh, sources, citations that we can provide, you know, we can go to Ignatius on the deity of Christ, and we can, we can do all this kind of stuff, and... Stop playing around, James. You can go to Ignatius from the deity, you can't go to Ignatius on the Eucharist. You can't go to Ignatius with what he talks about the bishops. You can't go to Ignatius on many other things. So stop playing games, all right? We recognize that when you look at the early fathers, James, just like many other individual Protestants, 
You can pick and choose what you like. The rest of the stuff you can abandon. We still have not heard how Epiphanius is clearly not talking about Mary being bodily translated into heaven. Where's the refutation? This is all they've got to establish, not to establish. See, this is what took me aback. It's one thing to go, well, this was the seed that eventually grew into the, 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 you know, the, 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 the oak tree. Um, that's not what they're saying. The, the argument here was everybody believed it. Just nobody ever mentioned except Epiphanius sort of let things slip there. Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up, but has not seen death. Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up. That's not what they're saying. The, the argument here was everybody believed it. Just nobody ever mentioned except Epiphanius sort of let things slip there. But this represents the entire faith of the early church. And I'm just like, I hope you wouldn't argue that way with a Unitarian. I hope you wouldn't defend the Trinity or something like that that way, because it's just, if that's all you've got, uh, that just shows, I have said many, many times, we can allow the early church writers to be the early church writers with all their insights, imperfections, ignorances, traditions, whatever. We can let them be what they are. Once Rome says this is a doctrine revealed by who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up, but has not seen death. I have grown tired of replaying it over and over. We're done talking about James White. I think you get the point. James White offers no refutation. James White has no clue about the tradition of the Dormition of John. He has no idea, or maybe he does have an idea, which is why he doesn't offer a refutation, but merely reads it and makes the grand mistake that, well, kind of like Dr. Gavin Ortland will, you know, is talking about Elijah being virgin from his mother's womb, uh, you know, perpetual virgin, but there's no parallel, no other, pa that, that is the only parallelism. You know, there's nothing else. The problem with that is that we have Greek text for the Greek scholar, Dr. James White, who has t Greek tattoos on his arm. So that gives him the qualities, qualifications of being a mega Greek scholar. He asked me, William, where did you go to seminary to study Greek? I have taught Greek. There's no biblical distinction between the Latria and Dulia. Wrap your head around that. James White has uttered those words before. Those words will follow him and haunt him for the rest of his life, along with a bogus bankrupt argument that Heos who proves that Mary had other children, sexual relations and other children. This is the man who Protestantism once in the past erected as their main guy. Today, people are recognizing that James White is no hero and James White is no scholar. Because if you look at the actual biblical Greek, the actual Greek word utilized here is a common term, <laughs> a common term for ascension or translation into heaven. Did he catch that? That Greek word utilized right there in Saint Epiphanius, Epiphanius, right there, is a common Greek term used. You find it in Byzantine liturgy. Indeed, James White once asked me, once asked me, William, do you ever, you know, can you even use the TLG or the PG or the PL? The Thesaurus Lingua Grecia, we utilize it for our book on Mary. The Patrologia Greca and the Patrologia Latina or Grecia, depending how an individual wants to pronounce the terms, we utilize them. We know how to utilize those databases, James White. We utilize them all the time. Stop pretending that you're going to beat people up over the head with fancy terms. You're not.
you're not an expert in Mariology and you're making a fool of yourself. We needed to do this video. And I've got to be quite honest. Uh, look, I didn't do this video to say, look, I'm going to take a shot at James White and refute him. God forgive me. I don't take James White seriously when it comes to Mariology. He's good. He's got a lot of other good work out there. I give him credit. It's good. Um, uh, back in the 1940s, he did good work on the Holy Trinity. Uh, back in 1931, he did really good work on the deity of Christ. Uh, I don't know about his stuff in Islam. I've never looked at it because I have uh, uh, people that are Islamic experts, you know, mega, mega geniuses in Islam uh, that have, you know, would never point to his work, would never point people trying to learn uh, about Islam to his work. They would never point to it. So I, I would consider it suspect. Um, he's done good work before. It's a point I'm trying to make. Uh, he wrote a really good book back in 1928. So He's done good work, is the point I'm making. But I don't find him very good when it comes to Mariology. But then again, who is good in Protestantism when it comes to Mariology? Go to YouTube.com or go to Google. What Protestant is good when it comes to Mariology? You, you, you tell me. You know, James White it was you know, the only video that I could find that dealt with St. Epiphanius and the bodily assumption of Mary. And he's dealing with it was a terrible, a terrible uh, way of dealing with it. It wasn't good. Look, I will give credit where credit is due. The kind of uh, work that was done there it just wasn't impressive. It wasn't good at all. Yet he's all that they have when it comes to this particular issue. I recognize this has been coming up lately in dialogue. I said, I'm going to deal with St. Epiphanius and the bodily assumption of Mary. So I brought up the video of James White look, people might say they want to share the video and say, James, are you going to reply to it? Look, I've been in communication with James for well over a decade. He's not going to reply to it. If he does, I would be shocked. I'd be blown away. There are people that James White loves going at, and there's people that he loves avoiding. James White relishes in avoiding me. He told me, he emailed me not long back, said that he knew better than to actually mention my name in a video that he recently did. He, sh he said he shouldn't have done it. And I think he kind of uh, intimated that he wouldn't be mentioning me anymore. I don't care. I'm not going away. James White knows I'm not going away. I'm here to stay. And I'm going to be th a thorn in his side. Anytime he utters the word Mary and blasphemy comes out of his mouth, I'm going to be waiting in the shadows to rip every one of his arguments to shreds. I'm not going away, James. You probably thought I was going away many years back. I'm not going away. I'm here to stay, and I'm going to keep an eye out. Any dividing line video, any argument that you bring up trying to attack our Immaculate Mother, I'm going to refute it. We will be doing more, more videos on recent in theology. We'll be refuting this kind of garbage that he's putting forth. Praise God. Praise our bodily risen Lord and Savior. Praise our triune God. All glory goes to God. No glory goes to me. But before ending it, we will end it on a sweet note. What does St. Epiphanius say? Like the bodies of the saints, talking about Mary. However, she has been held in honor. Well, she's held in honor. Well, so much for not giving Mary any honor. For her character and her understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, whoa! Hmm. Mary should be honored. Mary should be praised. There's veneration of Mary. She's like Elijah. Well, how was Elijah? Virgin from his mama's womb and always remains so. Well, veneration of Mary, honor given to Mary. Mary is ever virgin, i.e. Parthenos, and was taken up and has not seen death. The bodily assumption of Mary. I think it's the best way we can end our session tonight would be by asking James White, James, what does St. Epiphanius say about Mary? Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up, but has not seen death. Elijah, who was virgin from his, Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah.
Say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah. Say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. There is nothing sweeter than ending a session by allowing Dr. James White to embarrass himself in the very video where he calls Catholics abusers of the patristics. Tip of the hat, you didn't abuse them. You read St. Epiphanius. Too bad you didn't read everything, but you read what he says, like Elijah, ever virgin and bodily translated into heaven. Thank you very much, James White. Thank you. If Mr. Staples wanted to be accurate here, he'd continue on. Elijah, who was virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so and was taken up, but has not seen death. 